Okay, let's do this. Hello everyone and welcome to my first lecture video. Um, as I announced, I would want to like to talk about the analyticity of critical points of generalized integral Mayer curvature. And in this first part, I'm going to focus on the ideas how to make that work. And if after this talk you're going to say, well, this dude didn't really prove anything, well, then there's the second part with the details. Well, I still don't prove anything, but kind of more. <laughs> okay, this is joint work with Nicole Ford Obermeyer. She's uh, doing her PhD in Salzburg, and we've been funded by the DFG and the uh, FWF, which are science funds. Okay. First, let's talk about knots and knot energies, because generalized integral Mayer curvature is a knot energy. And I'm going to talk a lot about knots, so what is a knot? I said what is a knot? Oh, a knot. Obviously, this is a knot. On the other hand, I say a knot is an embedding, quote, let's say gamma, from R mod Z, so the unit circle, basically, into Rn, or R3, whatever you prefer. Of course, this piece of rope does not really represent a mathematical structure, so let's take a line doing, let's say, through the, through the center of the rope or something like that. And you might remember from the introduction video that this is not really a nice way to define a knot because I can just deform this thing into a straight line and I can do that really in an arbitrarily nice fashion. So let's close this up and then it's a bit hard. Um, you might remember we're jiggling around with that rope. Okay. And of course, we're dealing with mass, so let's get rid of reality. Let's get rid of the rope. Now we have a curve in Rn, and this is much simpler. Also, we hope. Okay. So, um, when are two knots considered the same? Well, we say that they're in the same knot class. And they are uh, in the same knot class if we can deform one into the other via ambient isotopies. And ambient isotopies. I'm not allowed to do two, thi two things, so I'm not going to define this rigorously, rigorously, just give a rough idea. Firstly, I want to evolve one knot into the other without passing strands through each other. Or I always want to evolve one knot into the other, but I'm not allowed to do two things, first of which is passing strands through each other. If you look closely here, this would switch the knot class, because this kind of is equivalent to cutting my knot open and gluing it back together after switching something. That's bad. We do not allow that. And on the other hand, I don't want to pull knots tight. I mean, if you imagine a rope, a rope, this thing has finite thickness. I mean, I can pull really hard on this knot, but it won't vanish. Well, here it can vanish if I'm not careful, because this thing has infinitesimal thickness, so at some point it's just gone. And this kind of changes the knot, <laughs> so we don't want that either. So if we don't do these two things, then we're probably fine. Then we say that two knots are in the same knot class. And how do we tell knots apart again? Well, <laughs> there are many approaches. The one I'm most familiar with is called knot energies, and you have this uh, functional that apply uh, maps the knot into the real numbers or the positive into the positive numbers and you want the knot classes to be separated by infinitely high energy walls. So actually this graphic can be found in quite similar fashion in a paper of my advisor but since there was copyright I had to do my own one for YouTube. Okay um, very nice, and you see that within each knot class we have a minimizer, obviously. I mean, obviously the space of knots is one-dimensional. No, it's not. It's infinitely uh, infinite-dimensional. We'll get to that a bit later. Okay. And a uh, knot energy is something that is more rigorously finite on all smooth knots. Makes sense. Which approaches infinity when the arguments uniformly approach a curve with a self-intersection. 
that sounds terrible, but in the end, it's just that we have one strand, we have another strand, and if they get to uh, move towards each other, each other, the energy gets bigger and bigger. And before they uh, when they touch, it gets to infinity. Okay, and lastly, this thing has to be bounded below because of reasons of characters of variations, basically. Okay, and this very nicely takes care of this first phenomenon I showed with this uh, passing strand through each other. What it does not take care of, and for historical reasons it's not contained in the definition of not an MJ, is pulling knots tight. <laughs> So we speak about tight knot energies if they prevent pulling knots tight, and then we really have divided the landscape uh, into knot classes via sublevel sets. Okay, and for a long time it has been expected that these uh, that minimizers of knot energies, so local minimizers, have nice properties, and then can be viewed at a, as a representative of the class. You guessed it, or if you paid attention in my abstract video, at least in our case, it works out. Okay, so to, let's talk about the knot energy I'm going to work with. It's called generalized integral maniacal curvature, which was in this form introduced by Simon Blatt and Philipp Reiter in 2015. It's a generalization of some things that were a thing that was introduced basically by Oscar Gonzalez and John Maddox but they didn't really work that much on it. So most of this work was done by Funda Mosley and Strelecki and various students of theirs. Okay, uh, let's take two, P, uh, two parameters, P and Q, greater than zero, an absolutely continuous curve so that we have different, uh, derivatives always everywhere. And then we define generalized integral minor curvature as uh, this triple integral. Here, these are the line elements, just ignore them. Uh, over one over this RPQ functional function depending on the three points gamma of u1 to gamma of u3 and RPQ is defined as the three differences of the points to the p divided by the wedge product if you do not know the wedge product just uh, imagine the cross product uh, to the q and I mean it's obvious what that does um, not really okay let's take our three points and then there's a unique circle passing through them, at least if they're not collinear. And this circle has a diameter. And of course, this diameter is called r, well, r11. It used to be the radius, but, you know, historical reasons. Um, so what Blatt and Reiter did is they decoupled this formula for the radius um, in the sense that they took the numerator and the denominator to different powers. And that's just that. So. Uh, in the end, it circles all the way down. So this thing is quite general, but it has spaces, uh, a certain subleft space associated with it. And actually, we can only handle the nice case where the subleft space is a Hilbert space. So it turns out that we need Q to be equal to 2, and we want P to be between 7 thirds and 8 thirds uh, because of regularity reasons and so on. Otherwise, this thing is not really nice. Okay, from now on, Q is equal to 2 and P is between 7 thirds and 8 thirds. You can forget that if you want, <laughs> but I have said it. Okay, um, lastly, before we get into it, we're going to need fractional subleft spaces. And if you haven't heard of them, they might sound quite scary, but the idea is quite simple. So you probably know Hölzer spaces, which are kind of interpolating between CK plus 1 and CK. And they're the generalization of Lipschitz space, uh, spaces. So we say that uh, gamma is in CKS, if and only if gamma is in CK. And the seminorm is bounded, and we have this difference, k of derivative of gamma at point u, u plus w minus k uh, derivative at point u divided by w to the s. And w can be between 0 and 1 half, or, well, between minus 1 half and 1 half but should not be zero. Okay, and you probably know these, so let's go through the fractional subleft spaces. I'm going to deal with the Hilbert case only. You can do that in a more general fashion, but we will need the Hilbert structure, so let's only do that. Then we call this subleft space HK, you know, this is 
the function and all its weak derivatives are in L2. Then hk plus s for s between 0 and 1, let's say, uh, is the space of hk functions where the seminorm is finite. And the seminorm kind of looks like the last one. So we have this difference of gamma k now to the power 2 and divided by w now to some other power. This is because of integrability reasons. But this is an actually well defined Hilbert space with the seminorm. You know, this whole norm can be taken by just taking the HK norm, whatever, whichever one you prefer, plus this one. Everything works out. Okay. This was the basic stuff. Let's get into the proof. Or, well, theorem first of all. So, this is nearly a theorem. We're just writing out the... Um, we're doing the fine-tuning right now, not for the theorem itself, but for the rest of the paper, really. Um, okay, so let's take a C1 curve. You probably don't need that, but nobody proved it, really. Uh, but let's take a C1 curve, uh, which is injective. Otherwise, the not energy would be infinite, you might remember. And it's parameterized by arc length. You really need that assumption, but let's come to that a bit later and which is also a critical point of our energy with respect to fixed length, then our curve is analytic. Um, maybe a short word to why do we need this arc length thing. Um, take the circle. The circle is a critical point for most knot energies that I know of. Uh, and it's even proven in most cases. Um, but you can... Uh, but this energy is invariant under reparameterization. And so you can parameterize the circle really, really badly. And of course, then it can't be analytic anymore. Okay, and this fixed length thing has to do with scaling. Let's leave it at that. Okay, how do we prove such a, such a thing? Well, luckily we don't live in a vacuum, so there's already been work done. First of all, we have this uh, paper by Lutt and Leiter, which introduced the energy. And they said, well, the energy is finite if and only if we are in this fraction of solar space. So this is between 1 and 2, regularity-wise. And uh, we know that if gamma is a critical point of the energy, then it's C infinity. That's very nice. <laughs> but you can do one better. <laughs> and actually, there has been work done. And this is not, um, and by my colleague uh, Nicole, and uh, together with her advisor Simon Blatt, that if gamma is a critical point for another knot energy called O'Hara's energy, or a class, subclass of that, then gamma is analytic. And now the way forward seems clear. We have this thing done for one knot energy. Let's do it with ours. Oh, okay. The slide says that. How do you do that? Well, looking up on Wikipedia, you see, uh, how do you pronounce it in English? Wikipedia, I think, sorry. Um, you see that gamma is in C infinity. Uh, if gamma is in C infinity, it is analytic if and only if the L derivatives is, uh, are bounded by C to the L plus 1 times L factorial. Okay, nice. How do we get that? Well, suppose we had a recursive estimate from somewhere. Someone came along and gave us this thing, such that we um, can bound the Alpha's first derivative of gamma by some function phi depending on the first L derivatives, and non-decreasingly uh, non so. So this is what the little arrows mean. And someone came along, or maybe the same someone came along and gave us an analytic function, which satisfies the same uh, inequality, but with equality. So the L plus first derivative of f at point zero, let's say, is equal to this phi of f zero up to f L of zero. And we know that f of zero is greater or equal than the norm of gamma. This is actually what is called Cauchy's method of majorance, because then we can inductively show that the L plus first derivative of gamma is bounded by phi of the first L derivatives of gamma, which, which are in turn bounded by the 
uh, f's or the derivatives of the f which is uh, and this phi of the f's is equal to fl plus one and as f is analytic we know that we have this bounce so there's a constant such that the L plus first derivative is smaller or equal than the L, uh, C to the L plus two times L plus one factorial. And well, so then gamma is bounded, the L, L plus first derivative of gamma is bounded, and so we are analytic. Very nice. Okay, but <laughs> I mean, this, this is a tall order, this recursive estimate and then this analytic majorant. How do we get these? The rough idea comes now, and the a few more details come in the next talk, so you may you may want to bear with me. Okay, first thing the first thing is scanning derivatives. In order to gain derivatives, you want to decompose your um, first variation into highest and lower order terms. This is what Blood and Reiter already did, uh, and we don't really need the first variation, but the first variation plus lambda times the first variation of the length functional because we have a critical point with respect to fixed length and so on. But, you know, the important part is may highest and lower order term. The highest order term is called Q and lower order term is R, Q for main term, R for remainder. And we're going to need an L2 version of that because of reasons. This reason is that one can show that for this L2 function, uh, the L plus third derivative of gamma can be bounded both by some constant times the Lth derivative of the main, uh, main term. And if we have a critical point, this whole thing is equal to zero, then the main term plus the remainder term is equal to uh, zero. The, so the remainder term is minus the main term, and so we have equality of the norms here. Okay. One can show. Actually, I will show this in the next video, so you might want to stick around. Now, we have this thing that where we say the L plus third derivative of gamma is bounded above by the L derivative of the remainder term, and the remainder term is a lower order thing. So we hopefully get some regularity gain. And you can try to work that out. So you can bound the remainder term above by some uh, function psi, depending on gamma prime up to gamma, uh, plus the upper second derivative of gamma in some other Sobolev norm. And then we plug all this together and then we say that the upper third derivative of gamma in some strange sub left norm is lower, uh, less or equal than this psi of gamma prime up to gamma L plus two, which looks very nice because we have an L plus three here and an L plus two here. And now we look at the sub left norms <laughs> and remember that P is between seven thirds and eight thirds. And it turns out that doesn't work <laughs> because if you work it out, you see that you gain only between one half and one derivative and you just don't get this one, which you would need for this recursive thing with the phi and so on. Well, too bad. <laughs> I promised we would show analyticity and this obviously does not work. <laughs> so, what to do? The answer is bootstrapping. Um, we iterate the estimate. For critical gamma, we already know that the upper third derivative of gamma in the HM norm, well, for any gamma really, is lower, less or equal than the L plus third derivative of gamma in the H M plus 3p minus 7 norm, which is a bit higher. And we have already shown that this thing here is bounded above by some this uh, constant times psi depending on gamma prime up to gamma L plus 2. And of course this psi is not increasing in these arguments. This is important. Okay. Now we know that we can bound gamma L plus three above by the main term, but then we need a gamma L plus three. So we cheat here and shift two derivatives from the uh, Sobolev norm into, well, into the argument of the Sobolev norm. And then we know that these, these things are bounded by the main term, by the norms of the main term. Well, some other norms because we have this shift thing going on. 
Okay, nice. And of course, we know that this is the same as the remainder term because we have critical gamma. And we already know how to bond the remainder term. And so we get this nested estimate depending on gamma prime up to gamma L plus 3. And then you might say, well, okay, we went from L plus 3 to L plus 3. That's a lot of work for nothing. But the important part is here. We go from HM to HM minus 1. So we actually gain a derivative, a whole derivative. This is very important. Okay, and let's, this is very long. Let's just call that phi. <laughs> and this is our recursive estimate. Very nice. So we now have this thing to get derivatives. We have taken care of the first part of the uh, method of majorans. And now we need a majoran. And the idea to get that is the cauchy kovaleski theorem or cauchy kovaleski theorem, depending on who you ask. Um, if we have an analytic function, um, so actually this theorem is, in a, is a PDE theorem, but you can, of course, simplify it to an ODE theorem. And in this case, it was really proven by Cauchy himself already. Um, let's take an analytic function from Rn into Rn. It, has, it doesn't have to be analytic everywhere, just around some point A. And let's take an ODE, c dot of t is equal to f of c of t, and c of 0 is, of course, the point where we are, are analytic. And then you can prove that c is analytic around 0. So this form can be found in the paper by Simon Blatt and Nicole Forder Obermeier. But the general case can be found in nearly every pretty ebook, I guess. So Evans, Taylor, whatever. OK, if we have that thing, you know, right -hand, analytic right-hand side means analytic solution. And then we want to find such an analytic f, such that the elf derivative of f of c of t are equal to phi, so this recursive estimate thing of the first L derivatives of c. And if c then is a solution to c dot equal to f of c of t, and c of 0 is, let's say, equal to the norm of gamma. I'm not really saying which norm. <laughs> then everything should work out. Well, in reality, it's not that easy. You have to take a second order equation and so on, but everything works out. Then c is analytic, and we have this uh, recursive equality, this recursion, really. And just as a reminder, since every derivative of c at point zero is larger than the corresponding derivative of gamma in the norm, and phi is not increasing its arguments, we can bound this below by this phi of the uh, derivatives of gamma. And we know by the recursive estimate that the L plus third derivative of gamma is, of course, smaller or equal to the phi of the first L, uh, L plus two derivatives. And since C is analytic, then by our uh, characterization of analyticity, gamma is analytic. Very nice. We're done. This was a, this was, that was a proof. Um, I should say that this method should be generalized, uh, extendable, let's say extendable, um, to a smaller regularity gains because you can just iterate this bootstrapping thing, then you have n nested equations, which will look really terrible, but in principle, it should work. Okay, and that was my part one. Thank you. You might want to take a little look at the references. See you for the next video, hopefully.